be of good cheer. <laughs> Let's be of good cheer together. That's a good idea. <laughs> That's a good idea. Um, one of my favorite moments with Dallas, because you'll often talk about being free of outcomes, mm -hmm. um, is for most people who speak, as soon as the talk is done, or for a lot of us that work at churches, as soon as the service is over, the first question is, how did it go? Yeah. Do you think it went all right? You know, am I losing my fastball? Am I still doing okay? <laughs> and I remember when Dallas had done a talk at our church one time, and we were walking out to the car in the parking lot, and he was just singing an old hymn. And um, it was like watching a child let a helium balloon go, where it's just, it's gone. And I remember seeing that and thinking, I want that in my body and I want that in my mind. Amen. The ability to do something and then just let it go. Amen. And that's life in the kingdom. So let's start there. Um, you just mentioned joy. Uh, one of my favorite games with Dallas is I'll ask him a word sometime and he'll always have a definition and it's sifted through everything everybody has said from Homer on and kind of articulated... <laughs> articulated in a way that you know you think gets it right that's part of why reading Dallas can be so dense sometimes because every word is used with a precision that just is not true for most of the rest of us and that makes the sentences really really um, dense but let's talk about joy why do you say that joy is a sense of pervasive well-being well because it's consistent with terrible circumstances one of my favorite passages on this is Paul when he's describing himself in, in 2 Corinthians. One of the contrasts he uses, sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Joy is consistent with sorrow because it is a realization of what's really going on in the world at large under God. It's joy. <coughs> And um, uh, you know, as uh, I think it is true, that joy is one of the hardest things we have associated with God. It's very difficult to think of God as joyous because he's got so many things to worry about. You know? But if you don't have a joyous God, you'd better head for cover, really. You know? It's a joyous God that fills the universe. But what's interesting about the definition to me is I'll think of joy often in something else, a sunset, a child, or something like that, but you tie it to a pervasive sense of well-being that right. even in a difficult situation, uh, joy is connected to that sense that I am okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that everything is okay. Is that what pervasive? Is that what you mean that's by pervasive? That's what I mean. I, that's, uh, that's, that's sort of... Sorry, I'm a little slow. So. <laughs> no, 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 that's an important point, John. No, but they were um, laughing at me. Oh, no. <laughs> um, that's, that's the ultimate word about God and His world. Creation was an act of joy. Say that again. Creation was an act of joy, of delight in the goodness of what was done. And actually, for human beings, very often their most joyous moment is a mm. creative moment. Mm. And uh, when they look back on it, they, they see the radiance mm. of that moment whether it's just working on an automobile or painting something or whatever it may be. It's the act of creation. Um, and you want to go back and look at it over and over again. Uh, I'm not much of a carpenter or anything else, but when I build something, uh, I tend to go back and look at it pretty often. <laughs> and it's the creative, the creative aspect that goes with the love of God mm. in creating. And so it's really important uh, to understand how joy uh, cuts through everything. It cuts through everything. 
and to anticipate that your moment of passage from this earth will be one of great joy. Hmm. Say a little more about that. One of the questions that got texted in was just around that life and death and life beyond death. Well, uh, what Jesus teaches us is that within his presence and with his word, we begin to live in heaven now. And that's why he says, those who keep my word will never experience death, as human beings understand it. The continuity of life through what we view as death from this point of view, because we do see people die, their bodies stop working. But they continue to exist as the people they are in the presence of God. And I like to say, I think it's true. I think many people will not realize they've died until later. And then they will recognize that something is different. And um, <laughs> I, I love that line from John Henry Newman's old song, Lead Kindly Light, where he says, And with the morning, or with the morn, those angel faces smile, that I have loved long since, and lost a while. See, that, that's the continuity. And really, that's what it's talking about, is the continuity of life lived now in the action and presence of God with His people. No. Somebody just um, sent me a line this last week from G.K. Chesterton. And he talks about, uh, at the end of his book, Orthodoxy, how sorrow, you know, is necessarily, inevitably a part of us right now, but never the most important part. And that what's essential to humanity is joy because of the nature of who God is in life. That's, that's but we the, live in a world yes. that looks at it the other way around now and where it's thought that joy is superficial and right. despair is deep. And uh, we have so many things pulling us away, and that's why Paul has to say in Philippians several times, rejoice in the Lord. Hmm. Why in the Lord? Well, that's where you find the basis for joy. Hmm. And uh, so rejoice in the Lord, hmm. and again I say rejoice. That's where the pervasive comes. That's exactly right. So we turn back to that. See, that's our part in living in the kingdom is to turn back to that and to keep Christ fu as fully present as we can uh, and uh, thank God for his grace in helping us where we can't uh, to our minds. Uh, we rejoice in the Lord. It's something for us to do. So it, it, it doesn't just sort of land on our head. Uh, and that's again this element of seeking, of participation, of cooperation that is essential to life in the kingdom of God. I was thinking when you were talking about seeking the kingdom, there's a way in which we seek joy too much or the wrong kind of it and look for TV or just avoiding unpleasantness. So there's a part of that that's really wrong. But then as you talk about joy, God, and creation, it strikes me there's another part of us that doesn't seek it nearly enough or the right kind of it in every moment. And that's part of why we don't love the kingdom the way that we might. Unfortunately, when people first, uh, this is very clear in the Gospels, and I've watched it for years, when people first hear about the kingdom, they think all their problems are going to be solved. And um, they think of their problems as needing something to eat or whatever it may be. And that's important, God knows, and Jesus was very... Uh, uh, gracious with providing food for people to eat, uh, but that's not our ultimate need. And our great need is to see our place in Christ's world, in his kingdom, and to know that everything is taken care of. We don't have a thing to worry about. 
And, uh, and you know, you say that in our world, and my goodness, uh, the, all the terrible things that happen, and, uh, and, you, and you say, oh, boy, I've got plenty to worry about, and all these people have plenty to worry about, and I understand that. But that's not the solution. The solution is to acknowledge the presence of the kingdom in the most awful of events. Where was God in Auschwitz? He was in Auschwitz. Why didn't he do what we think he should have done? Well, that's a long and difficult story to which I don't have an answer. But there is a meaning to human history, including Auschwitz, and God is over all. And he will see to it that what is good and right is done. But you always have to add the, the larger picture. Come back to that question of practically seeking the kingdom of God. I remember talking about that one time in a woman who was the mom of young kids said it was easier for her to seek the kingdom when she was single, didn't have kids because now they got in the way. Um, she used to have a lot more time for quiet time and so and it was just yes. one of those pictures of how we restrict it to certain activities and certain times. Yes. Can you say a little bit more, you talked a little bit about in a relationship and a face-to-face -face encounter how you seek the kingdom. I'll give you three other just experiences and then if you talk a little bit about them, this is sound a little strange. Um, in our work, what does it look like to seek the kingdom? Um, at play, what does it look like to seek the kingdom when we're just at play, at leisure? And then, you know, you were talking a little bit about sexuality and lust and so we so often talk about the dark side of that. This sounds odd, I've never thought about it like this before, but I don't mean to be glib with it. What does it mean when, when a husband and wife are uh, having sex with each other? What does it mean to seek the kingdom? Like, how do you bring the, the reality of God, the presence of God? So what does it mean in those well, activities? To cover all of those cases, we realize that all that is good is God in action. That is God in action. Whether it is a sexual or romantic relationship or play, God plays. God plays? Yes. Um, creation was play for God. And so when we play, what is good in play, if we can experience it, this is not an easy thing in a fallen world, we see God in what is good in play. Never pictured God at play before? Well, again, it's, it's a little difficult because we're not familiar with play. If you want to see play, you have to find a little child who has nothing to play with, and they're still playing. <laughs> they never stop. We, one of our kids, when she was little, uh, we would punish her by putting her in the timeout chair, and we did that, but she just sat there grinning. And so we finally asked her, what are you doing? And she said, I'm thinking in cartoons. <laughs> Well, that's wonderful. And uh, that's in the basic nature of persons, is to play. And it takes, um, for the adult to play, it's very hard. Because they're so serious about everything, making everything happen and seeing to it that things come out right, whatever that is. Uh, and we don't know how to play uh, work, of course, uh, is related to play because both are domains of creativity. Hmm. Work creates value. And uh, to be able to enter into that with God who is at work uh, and to watch for Him to move uh, is a great part of life in the Kingdom of God. If work is creation of value, what is play? Well, play is creation of values that are not necessary. Mm -hmm. I, I keep waiting for you to say, I don't know. <laughs> you 
know, it's uh, you. You throw yourself upon lo- on the Lord, uh, and you put yourself forth, and you see what ha- happens. And sometimes it's helpful. Mm-hmm. Patrick Henry was said to be a great orator, and he was described as someone who would throw himself in at the beginning of a sentence, trusting in God Almighty to get him out at the end. <laughs> That's creativity. <laughs> yeah. Huh. And, and that's really living in the kingdom. And um, in our relationships with other people at work or play or uh, yeah. perhaps more than anywhere else uh, in our love relationships. Um, we need to have that kind of abandonment to God. Do, do you have an image or language or a question or a minder to try to help you in that? I know Frank Lubbock used to talk about games with minutes where he would kind of use a time frame to try to bring himself back to it. Practically, are there things that you do to help you seek the kingdom in the different events of your day? Actually, I don't think so. I... I... Uh, will come back frequently and ask myself, you know, now, how are you doing this? What are you trusting? Uh, and especially in our kind of work, you're, where you're mainly working with persons. Are you approaching this person in the presence of God? You know? That is not trying to control it. Uh, giving your best to it, but your eyes are on God. Uh, so I, I don't think I could say that I love Laubach's game with the minutes, um, but uh, I haven't been able. It's it's a little like the Jesus prayer for me. I can use the Jesus prayer. I couldn't use it all the time, um, and so often I will substitute some other language, and I do like to keep something running there. But I, I, do, I, I do think it's really important in the spiritual life to not be too controlling. Hmm. And uh, that, that's one of the things I, I'm, I'm afraid often that uh, teaching about spiritual formation falls hmm. into. is a little more controlling than is really healthy. And that's where the element of play would come in. Um, so I, I don't have a... Yeah. Can I ask you about another word? Yes. Because uh, you mentioned this last night and today a few times, talking about the yoke and seeking kingdom. You talked about dignity. The dignity of the easy yoke That's and right. the dignity of seeking the kingdom. Right. What is dignity and why is it important? Dignity is worth that has no substitute. If a thing has dignity, there's nothing you can substitute for it. Now, that's not mine. That's Immanuel Kant. Okay. Most things have a price. That means there's a substitute. There's a price on the cheeseburger. That means if you give that money to that person, he will give you the cheeseburger. But one reason why, even in our legal system, we still have the, the blessed law that you can't sell human beings is because they have dignity. And this is what Lewis, of course, is driving at in the greater weight of glory, where he talks about that. And Bonhoeffer is dealing with the same thing in life together. Every person has a dignity and then when you see a person who doesn't realize that and they don't associate it with their work and in a, in a society where so often dignity is associated with work, the crushing burden of unemployment, see, is you begin to understand why it's such a terrible thing and, and how it's important to understand that employment is not a job, though it may be a job. Employment is the creation of value. It's work, but it can also be play. And in the kingdom of God, we're set free uh, to live that way. Abandonment to God. Madame Guillaume was imprisoned for years. 
because of her religious views. And she wrote a little poem about how she sits and sings in her prison and how she is content that God has placed her there. See, she retained her dignity because she retained her connection to God. And that's what's crucial. That's what gives human beings the dignity that they have lost by and large through alienation from God mm -hmm. and through living in a way where others are attacked and they are attacked and this process of evaluating that goes on so ceaselessly. Now what a relief it is to be able to meet people without evaluating them, without sizing them up in some way. Um, and you can do that in the kingdom of God. I was just thinking as you were talking about that, how rare it is for people to find a place that confers dignity on them. And That's right. When I think of the word, I often think more of gravitas or somebody who's more formal. Yes, that's, that's but, how but, we have abused the, yeah. the idea. Uh, we think of it as something that is subject to human attitudes and control. And it's beyond all of that. And we have to step out of that. And we do that by stepping into the kingdom of God. And it doesn't matter how this person looks or what has happened with them or what they're thinking and so on. I meet them as God's creature. I meet them as something for God, which God has a destiny, a high destiny, higher possibly than they could ever believe. Mm -hmm. Now then, as spokespeople for Christ, you see, it's so important that we carry this to people. And there's so many ways in which human beings have cut people down and we have to cut through all of that as best we can as we live and deal with other people. And also, I have failed so many times at it. Um, and my younger life was caught up entirely in this evaluation thing and so on. So that's where seeking allows you to be drawn out of that mm -hmm. and it allows you to change and you become different and God cooperates with that project. Another just real practical question around that. You said that uh, in seeking the kingdom you have to want it more than anything else. That's right. Uh, let's say there's somebody here and they say the honest truth is I don't want it more than anything else. The honest truth is I want to have more money or I want to be successful or I want to be loved by this person. If I'm honest about it, mm -hmm. often I find I don't want it more than anything else. Right. And I can't flip a switch and make myself want it. Right. So what should a person do if they find themselves in that situation, which I think probably all of us sometimes do? No, this is the classic position of uh, Romans 7. Uh, we have so many different things going on in our lives and personalities. Uh, that uh, we can't master all of the impulses. So now this is what we have to talk about uh, tonight, I think it is, about how we have to go to the parts of the self mm. and identify what it is that defeats us. Mm. Uh, suppose I have, honestly, as you put, I want people to like me. And I want that more than anything else. Now, in order to deal with that, I have to go back to that with the Holy Spirit, with the Word of God, and I have to look at that. And uh, this is a major part of repentance, is looking at things and seeing them for what they are. And for the most part, um, that alone will begin to loosen the grip. Just seeing things for what they are. But we have to be willing to do that. And we have to believe that it's safe for us to do that. And that's where the, the preaching of the gospel and the coming of Jesus 
hopefully some other people around us have taught us that it is safe to do, to do that. And then we can begin to break through, as Paul does in Romans 8. Uh, we can begin to get back up the things that drive us, and we can come to the point where I, I, I don't greatly worry about what people think about me. We can come to that place. Let's, let's role play that for a moment. Let's say I come to you and we're talking with each other and I say, the re the, I, I realize that I really want that more than I want anything else. I want people to think well of me. How do we talk about that together? How do you talk about that with me to help me with that? Well, that we start with, why do you do that? What is it that makes you want that? Uh, we might talk about people who don't, that you know who don't want that and ask how are they able to function without that. Um, and uh, I think if we do that, then we begin to get an entree into the dynamics of the self, which unfortunately uh, the religion of the scribes and the Pharisees do not deal with. I don't think our churches do mostly. I, I, like, it takes time to do that. It does take time. Indeed it does. Uh, and process and uh, uh, returning to the question over and over. And, and this is the process of discipleship. See, this is what we can be doing in our groups of disciples is finding out uh, with one another what is driving and possessing us. And I'm, I'm sure there are cases where possession has to be dealt with in a, in, a, in a different way. But for the most part, we're possessed by stuff that we haven't actually thought about. And we haven't asked ourselves, where did that come from? And um, that's what we have to do. If the person who has realized, I don't honestly seek the kingdom above all, that's a big step forward. And then you can say, well, what do I seek? And why do I seek it? And how can I get back of that and release it by the grace of God? All of this is by the grace of God. It sounds like we have to find a way to get a lot more honest and open than we generally are. No, we just need to pause and hear that. See, we need to find a way to be a lot more open and honest. That, but you see, religion tends to make you closed and dishonest mm. <laughs> and uh, stepping into the kingdom means that we begin to feel the redemptive power of the kingdom moving into all of that and setting us free I mean, the person who is closed and dishonest is manipulating the people around them for, his, for their own benefit so we have to know what that is and understand what drives it and absolutely go to God for help but to use whatever devices that will help us uh, uh, to overcome it. Now that's where our last session on uh, Saturday morning comes in because uh, the, as in my thinking this is a very orderly process and uh, that's if you want to change something, then you uh, identify the disciplines that will help you to do that. And um, sometimes they're rather foolish. Um, perhaps the high water mark in this regard was uh, Saint Benedict who, in order to escape lustful thoughts, threw himself into a briar patch. I think that would do it. <laughs> But then you, you have to get beyond briar patches because they're not always available. <laughs> um, so that's, yeah. that's, but dis see, disciplines is, is again an area of creativity. They're not law. Mm. Yeah. They are a venture. Uh, they're venturing on the reality of the kingdom. And we learn ways from others and they set us free. And uh, so, um, 
All of this hangs together and we just need to do it. But most people do not have that association when they hear the word discipline. No, I know that's true. Uh, uh, and uh, it's, it's quite unfortunate that Satan, if I may speak that way to make it simple, Satan seizes every word hmm. and twists it. And uh, he will do that to spiritual formation. He has done it to discipleship. Because in, in some evangelical circles, spiritual formation was introduced because the people concerned thought that discipleship had been utterly drained of its meaning. And it had, so far as its New Testament meaning especially is concerned, because it had become associated with particular things by good and well-meaning people, many of whom were sincere disciples of Jesus. But then that way that passed on to others was discipleship was bondage to legalism. And so particular things like quiet time become bondage and they're, they're not fruitful. They can be made fruitful, but you can't just grind away at something that isn't fruitful and make it fruitful. And the first thing you need to say, like I often tell people uh, who come to me complaining about church, well, stop going. And usually that's enough of a shock to them too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but the idea is we need to understand what going to church is about. And it's, it's a wonderful thing and it can be a wonderful thing for anyone but not if you go to figure out whether or not the performers are going to perform and everyone is going to be their churchy best, you know. <laughs> And so that raises the question, which I discuss in, in Knowing Christ, of what, what, is, what is church meant for? Mm -hmm. 